that, yeah, we weren't able to gather together at a retreat site, but man, for those that came with an open heart and hungry heart, you really experienced God moving and encountering you powerfully. Amen? Amen. God is so good. He, God is beyond any campsite. God is beyond any walls of a building. Right? God is near. God is not just transcendent. He's not just a distant figure. But He's near. Right? He lives in you, as Pastor Jimmy was talking about. And so let's remember that. Let's hold on to that. And can we step into this time of prayer confessing that? Saying, Holy Spirit, we don't want to just welcome you here. We want to acknowledge your presence that's already here. We want to acknowledge you. Holy Spirit, come. We're giving you permission. I'm giving you permission to move in my room. I'm giving you permission to move in my heart at this moment. I'm here for you. Holy Spirit, come. We welcome you and we acknowledge your presence. We don't want to just keep saying come and come and we welcome you, but we want to say and know you're here. You're actually living within me for those who have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. So can we make that our first prayer right now? Can we just stretch out our hands in a posture of receiving? And can we just begin to confess that together, say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We acknowledge your presence. I know you're here. I know you want to move. I just got to let you. I just got to let you. So Holy Spirit, come. Let's begin to pray that together. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come have your way. Come and have your way in this place, in this room. We welcome you, Lord. We welcome you, Lord. You're not a distant God. You're not a distant Father. But God, you are near. You're so close. You're living within me. You're closer than any parent. You're closer than any sibling. You're closer than any loved one. So we acknowledge your presence and we give you permission to move in our hearts in this moment. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come on. Yes, Lord. Can we take this time and I want you guys to just be able to look at your Zoom screens. And some of them might have their screens turned off. It might just be their name. And I want to encourage you, if you guys can turn on your screen to turn it on, to all stand and join me in prayer. But I want to take this moment and I want to ask you guys, can you guys just begin to pray and lift up the people that are around you in Zoom? Just the names that you see around you, can you just begin to bless them? Like, I really want you to pray and say, God, may they encounter you in such a radical way. Soften their hearts. Soften their hearts. God, I don't want to be the only one blessed. I want to see my brothers and sisters encountering you. I want to run this race together with those in my small group, with my leaders. I want to see God moving in my community. So can we just take a moment, can we begin to lift up the people around us at this time? So let's cry out Jesus three times and let's begin to pray for them. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, we come and we just want to lift up the people around us. Lord, we pray for Pastor Mike. Pastor Nate, Pastor Tony, Lord, I pray that you will lift them up in this moment. Lord, that there will be such a release of your presence in their life that they would encounter you in such a radical way, God. Such a radical way. So we want to run this race together with you. We want to run it together as a family, as a body of Christ. God, may they truly be blessed. Lord, we're praying that 
All of our brothers and sisters will not be distracted. We pray against every distraction in the name of Jesus. We pray against every zoo fatigue. We pray against any confusion. We pray for clarity. We pray for an open heart and mind that our brothers and sisters would truly receive this word that's about to be spoken over us. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. If you're not standing, I want to encourage you one more time to join us. Be active. Don't be comfortable in your chair. Don't be comfortable in your bed. But be active in your worship. Okay? The scriptures doesn't say love the Lord with all of your voice. But the scripture says to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. To give him our all. To give him our very best. To give him everything that we have. So at this moment, can we just take this time and can we pray? Just thanking him for the cross. Remember Pastor Jimmy really spoke over the power, the importance of beholding the cross. Can we thank him for the cross? But can we also thank him because of the death and resurrection of Jesus? Guess what? We have hope. We have hope. Something that no one else can claim to have, really. We have hope. So can we thank God for these two things right now? Can we thank Him for the cross that sets us free, that saved us, that rescued us from this present evil age? And can we thank Him for the hope that we can have, the hope that we find through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? So let's cry Jesus three times. Let's focus on Him and let's thank Him for all that He's done in our life. So let's pray together. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Father, we come and we thank you. You are so good. You are so good. We are so good. Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you that the cross washes away my sin. The cross cleanses me that I can have a relationship with you. That, Jesus, you made the way. You made the way. Thank you, Lord, that in all the circumstances of my life, I can look to you. I can look to you, God. In the good times, in the bad times, in the mountain tops, in the valleys, God, we can look to you so we can have hope because of the resurrection of Christ. Thank you for your death on the cross that sets me free, that gives me life, that sets me free from sin, that gives me eternal life with you. But thank you also for your grace. Thank you for the resurrection power that lives in me, that gives me hope for tomorrow, that gives me hope to continue to live. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Receive it all, Lord. Receive it all. Receive it all, Lord. Receive it all. Yes, Lord. My last prayer before we go into time of worship. Once again, if we can be active. And once again, if we can just lift up our hands and a posture surrender. I'm not going to force you to do it. I'm just asking for those that are willing and wanting to just lift your hand and a posture surrender and humility. And that's what we're going to pray right now. Say, God, in this moment of worship, I'm surrendered before you. In this moment of worship, Lord, help me to approach you with humility. Put away my pride away my distractions, put away my mom or my dad or my siblings in the next room, put away all of that, put away the people that might be looking at me in Zoom, put away all of that, my focus is you, I'm here for you, I'm here for you, and so in a posture of humility, in a posture of surrender, let's just confess that one more time, say God I'm here for you, 
I'm not here for nobody else. I'm not here to make anybody happy. I'm not here to get a pat on the back. I'm not here to make my mom or my, my small group leader happy. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. This is not a check mark off my Christian life. I'm here because this is an opportunity to encounter the living God. So let's come before him with a posture of humility and let's confess this. Let's cry out Jesus three times on, on three and then we're going to go into a time of worship. Let's pray. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord. We're here for you, Lord. We're not here because we got to be here. We're not here for any other reason. We're here for you. We're here for you because you are worthy. We're here for you because you deserve it. We're here for you because we love you. We're here for you because we want to encounter you. We're not here to make nobody happy. We're not here to put a check mark on our box to do another retreat. We're here to encounter the living God. Meet us here. Meet us here. No, we're surrendered before you this moment. We're here in a posture of humility. Lord, we don't deserve to be here, but by your blood, by your grace, by your Son, we can stand holy before you and worship. So we're here for you. We're here for you, Lord. We're here for you, Lord. Come meet us here, Lord. We're here for you, Lord. We're here for you, Lord. Come and have your way. Circumstances may still be bad, even though our seasons may still be confusing, that God is still on the move. He is not called the God of faith, and He's not the God of the dead, but He's God of the living, and He's a God that brings breakthrough, whether this season may look good or even when this season may look bad. So can we just stand up in faith and just give our hearts to Him right now? Jesus, the breakthrough, you are the God of the breakthrough. See my way through, and I really don't know what to do. I look to you the way through, and walls fall down when I shout through. Strongholds break when I pray through. So I'm gonna praise you, you are the God. Let's see that again. You see the way through, you are the God of the brain through. When I can't see my way
really don't know what to do. I look to you, break through. Walls fall down when I shout through. Strongholds break when I praise you. I'm going to praise you. You are the God. You are the God of the breakthrough. Thank you, Jesus. You're the God of the breakthrough. You are the God of the
Thank you guys thank you praise team uh, man so good we're gonna miss you guys um, well today we uh, are closing out our last retreat session and uh, man uh, it's a, gonna be a, such an exciting one it's gonna be a good one uh, pastor Jimmy is here in the flesh live right uh, there's going to be no, like, that lag issue or, like, you know, he yells all of a sudden and it goes really loud in your ears or anything like that. Uh, it might still happen. But uh, either way, uh, we're so excited to have him here to really speak uh, the, uh, the last word to us. And I don't know about you guys, but, man, the last two days has been so good. It's such a, such a powerful reminder of who Jesus is in our lives. And, uh, man, it's life-changing. Um, and so uh, we're, before we get into uh, the word, okay, we want to kind of recap and kind of bring everything back to a close and kind of even remind us of how and where we even started. And so we're actually going to play uh, our retreat video one more time uh, just for everyone to watch, be inspired, be encouraged, kind of have the right heart and mindset. And right after, uh, Pastor Jimmy is actually going to just come straight up and he's going to deliver the word uh, right away and he's going to go right into it. Okay, so if you guys are ready and if you guys are excited, uh, can y'all give some clap emojis, thumbs up emojis, fire emojis, let's go, like, come on, let's be excited, all right? Y'all ready to see Joe Teacher box again? I mean, yo, come on, that's fire, okay, and you're going to see Tim, T Tim Teacher crying a little bit, okay? But um, <laughs> nothing new, nothing new, right? Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but let's, let's watch the video and let's really... Watch it with an open heart um, and an eager heart. And then uh, let's be ready for Pastor Jimmy to come and really uh, preach the word. All right? Are we ready? Sorry, I got distracted for a second. 
Are we not ready? We're not ready? Oh, man, that's awkward. Why are you going to put me in this position, guys? Okay. All right. Uh, you know what? I wasn't going to do this, but um, I guess I got to do it now. Okay. Uh, can, someone, can someone bring me the raffle box again? All right. We're, we're going to do, do another raffle. Okay. And this time, uh, you know, this time uh, whoever wins, uh, this is totally unplanned for. Well, because I'm on stage and I got the mic, I got the power. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so whoever wins this raffle, okay, uh, you guys will receive a free complimentary boba, okay, uh, from the pastor of your choice. All right? The pastor of your choice. Whoever wins, you get to choose, all right? Uh, with the exception of me. No, I'm just kidding. I'll put myself in there. All right, so ready. We're, 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 we're going to do this. All right, we're, we're going to kind of we're gonna kind of give it out to you. All right, so let's do this, all right? Uh, hey, if you choose P. Mike or P. Tony, I'll make sure you win, all right? Just letting you know, okay? All right, here we go, here we go, okay? Uh, I'm going to open up this chat because I have no idea what's going on and who's winning. All right. All right, okay, here we go, here we go. Okay, you can't choose Pastor Jimmy, bro. You don't even know him. Come on, man. Come on, dude. Hey, y'all junior high kids got no chill, man. You guys are bold, dude. Seriously, you guys are so bold. All right? Let's get deep in here, okay? Ooh, all right. You guys ready? All right, here we go. You guys ready? Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Okay. Uh, Min, you are not going to choose Pastor Shine, dude. Come on. You ain't got the guts for that. Let's be real here. Come on. Okay? All right. <laughs> Okay, passive choice meaning either P Mike, P Tony, or P Nate. Okay, all right. Ready, one zero seven four. Oh yeah, I know some of you guys have been waiting for the four. Okay, one zero seven four four two. One zero seven four four two. If y'all threw away your raffle ticket because I told you to, I am so sorry. <laughs> I just remember I told you guys to crumple and throw it away. Um, but yeah, one zero seven four four two. Hey, who won? Let me see. Mini, Mini. Oh, Mini. Let me see your ticket. Come on. Let me see your ticket, Mini. Mini, where you at? One zero seven. Let me see. Come on. Four four two. Oh, congratulations, Mini. Yo, hey, she already wrote Pastor Tony's name on that ticket too. Wow, she ready. Well, she already wrote Pastor Timmy, Tony's name on that. Okay, thank you for choosing Pastor Tony. I appreciate it. Okay, wow. Dude, Minhee won and she chose you to buy her a large boba. Okay, wow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So good. So good. Okay, regular? Okay, maybe. No, she's got shit with Amy, you know. She, she got siblings, you know. All right, okay. Well, congratulations for winning, Minnie, And we're going to now head into the video. Okay, and um, right after the video, uh, Pastor Jimmy's going to go for it. All right, let's go.
What's up, GMI family? Uh, I can see myself. I see all of you guys because I made a really weird request to put the Zoom video right under the recording camera. So I can see all of you guys. And if you are ready to go into the word, give me a quick thumbs up. I just want to see everybody. Yeah. Shout out to my boy, Matthew. Every day I see Matthew and he is just holding it down. Like he is so intent, so focused. Whenever I see Matthew's beautiful little face, it makes me want to preach better. So God bless Matthew. Shout out. All right. Let's just go straight into the word. I don't want to waste any time today. Revelations chapter 21. That's right. I said it. We go in there. Revelations chapter 21. All right. And while you guys turn there, I wanted to tell you a little bit about today's message. It's called Behold, He is coming and making all things new. And obviously, He being Jesus. So behold, Jesus is coming and making all things new. Now, as I was preparing this message for you guys, I had a lot of, like, teaching points that I wanted to get through, a lot of scriptural things that I wanted to get through, and there were just so many things on my heart as well that I wanted to share. Um, and I don't think that everything is relevant. I don't think you guys need all of that stuff. And so I just want to focus on some of the basics. Is it okay today if I just share some stories, I just talk about God, and we just enter into a time of prayer? Because you guys don't need any more teaching in 2020. You don't need any more new thoughts or good ideas or whatever. You, you have the rest of your life to do all of that. Today, I just want us to go into a time of prayer and really dig deep into the spirit of the Lord. And I know that some of you guys are in your room. And I want you guys to be going all out so that your mom in the other room is like, what the heck is going on in there? And then they come into your room, they open the door, and they're filled with the Holy Spirit that they themselves get distracted. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, somebody. All right. So with that being said, we're just going to tell a couple stories. We're just going to dig deep into the Lord. And I'm excited to be here with the praise team. Super awesome. And we're just going to pray. All right. With that being said, let's go to Revelations chapter 21. If you're still not there, you are definitely not a Bible reader. And you have a new hobby and a new New Year's resolution for 2021. Come on, somebody. If you guys have a New Year's resolution... Write that into the chat. I'm going to be reading Revelations 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne, said, I am making everything new. This is the word of God. Amen. Eyes are closed and heads are bowed. God, I come before you right now and I ask simply, Lord, that you would speak what you want to speak and you would begin to do what you want to do. I pray, Lord, that we can conclude this retreat, conclude this year in a way that is pleasing unto you. And Holy Spirit, right now, we, we honor you, Holy Spirit. We recognize that man has a spirit as well. And man's spirit can touch another person's spirit. We've seen coaches riling up their players. We've seen bands get an entire arena of concert goers to become hyped. We've seen DJs make everybody start dancing. We know that people can affect other people. We know preachers can make audiences cry and laugh and all these things, but we are not looking for the movement of man's spirit to man's spirit, for the things of man's spirit to man's spirit is temporary, and it fades away. Emotional highs from a retreat after one week tend to fade away, but Lord, we want the movement of the Holy Spirit today. We don't want just words and stories and sermons to sway our feelings and emotions for a couple hours. No, Holy Spirit, we want you to come and tear our hearts, to lift our spirits, to fill us with a new joy and a new life. 
I ask, oh Jesus, that you would come into the room of every single student watching, every single teacher watching, every single pastor watching. I ask, oh Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would do a new thing. Lord, we don't want another emotional high. We want to see those encounters that tend to shape and, and, and change the path of a person's life. So, Father, I come before you and I ask, would you come and do it again, Lord? Jesus, the same way you showed me your love, the same way you presented it to me, would you present that, oh God? The same way you changed my life and the path that I was walking on, would you change their path, Jesus? And I know that a good sermon cannot create that. And I know a bad sermon cannot get in your way. So, Lord, I give it all unto you. And I just pray that it would not be the fancy words of a man that should sway a heart. But, Lord, Holy Spirit, it would be you who comes. I surrender all to you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, look over here real quick. Um, I want to just share a couple things with you guys throughout this text, share a couple stories, and I realized I never really shared my testimony with you guys, and so I would love to do that, and if you guys were at the revival that I spoke at GMI like three, four years ago, some things might sound familiar, all right, so if that, if that does, well, you get double blessing of the, of the story, amen. With that being said, Revelation chapter 21 is probably one of the most epic testimonies or epic uh, stories of anybody in the Bible seeing a prophetic image of Jesus, right? John actually got to see the new heaven coming to earth. He actually got to see the end of the world, all right? No other prophet, no other person in the Bible ever sees that. Everybody else in the Bible saw Jesus on earth in his human form, and only Peter, James, and John got to see him in his glorified form when they went up the Mount of Transfiguration. But only John gets to describe Jesus in the second coming, right? This is really one of the craziest passages, and I love to share this because you and I, we get a sneak peek to the end of the story. And you know what's so awesome about knowing the end of the story is that it gives you strength to fulfill this current journey. What am I talking about, all right? I am a Laker fan, okay? If you are a Clipper fan, you're trash. I'm sorry, right? Let me tell you the hierarchy of L.A. basketball. It's the L.A. Lakers, and then it's the UCLA basketball team, and then it's the Sparks, and then it's the USC basketball team, and then it's your local YMC basketball team, and then it's the Clippers, okay? Laker number one, Laker gang out here, okay? But let me tell you all something. I remember, whoo, okay, oh man. I remember they had the 2008 series in the bag at the Celtics, but then they lost. The Celtics won. And Kevin Garnett really ignorantly was like, anything is possible, all right? Okay. Oh man, traumatized me, triggered me, all right? But then a couple years later, whew, they have game seven. Right? And I remember me and all my homies, we're, we're at our friend's house, and we're watching the game. And we're like, oh, shoot, game seven. Oh, man, oh, he, they better win, right? They could lose it, whatever. And then Kobe, like, they're dribbling. They're always handing it to Kobe. And Kobe's, like, you know, doing his thing. Rest in peace, Kobe, right? 2020. I, okay, this is a tangent, but I remember I was on my honeymoon in, in January 2020, early. My wife wakes me up. And she's like, honey. Kobe died. And I was like, shut up. You're lying. It's like, stop trying to, stop trying to prank me. She's like, no, Kobe died. Really? I got up immediately. I looked at my phone. And then I saw all these stories. I got all these texts. Like, all my homies were like, bro, Kobe died, right? Like, all of these texts. And I remember I just, in my, in my honeymoon bed, a tear shed. I was like, Kobe, right? Anyways, if you go back, 2010, it's game seven. There, it's like neck and neck. It's just constantly going back and forth, back and forth. And I was stressed the entire time. I was, I was pulling hair out. I was just in a terrified state, right, at the chance that they might lose. Fourth quarter, comes down to an end. Kobe, uh, you know, Kobe and the rest of the Lakers, I don't even, nobody else matters. It's just Kobe and the rest of the Lakers. They win. They hit the game-winning shot. And they just, they're champions and all of that good stuff. And let me tell you all something. The second the clock ended, a feeling of relief just came over my entire body. And I was like, yes, 
Woo, this is awesome. Now, every time I go back, okay, I'm a loser, but I still go back and I watch YouTube highlights of that year. All right, game seven, 2010, I believe. And I remember every stressful moment of my life when I was watching that game all those years ago, now I watch it and I'm like, <laughs> they don't know the end of the story, right? And now all the moments that stressed me out, pissed me off, got me anxious, made me jump on my feet, I'm just, I'm just at peace now. I'm like, I know the outcome of this story. I know the end. And it's that we win. And let me tell you all something. When you know the end of the story, all of the stressful parts, all of the chapters that seem like it's going to end in a, in a dead end, all the parts that make it seem like it's a horror story rather than a happy ending, let me tell you, when you know the end of the story, it actually changes the way you go through the story. See, when you don't know the end, you get stressed out, you get scared, you get terrified. But when you know the end of the story, you have peace. And that's why I believe the, the people who put the Bible together said we should put the prophecies of John into the Bible because the believers need to know that the end of our lives, it ends with us winning. See, every part that you go through in this life, the stressful parts, the scary parts, the hopeless parts, you can either let those things get you down or you can remind yourself of the end of the story and realize we win in the end. I want to tell you a couple stories about uh, this time when we went to Bolivia on a mission trip. We finished ministering to all of the churches and all of that stuff, and our team wanted to go for a fun ride. So we all rented bicycles in Bolivia, and we went to a mountain, and there's a road called Death Road. Every year, people who bike on Death Road fall off the side of the cliff and actually die, right? And I'm like, this is a terrible idea. Why are we taking our mission team to ride on death road, right? But our pastor, Pastor Paul, he's an insane cycle of a man, right? And he's just like, let's do it, right? And I'm like, okay. So everybody goes on death road and they're cycling. And our team is going. And then there's this one part where it's like downhill and you can't control your speed. And that's the part where most people fall off the cliff. And so you're supposed to go really slow, but some people lost control. And some of our team members started to zoom down, all right? We had one brother named Daniel Kim. He's now pastor at Onuri Church. He falls off the side of the cliff, and a, a tree hanging off the side of the mountain was there. He grabbed it before he fell off the side of the cliff. Another sister, her name is Mia Jew. She, she's like cycling down the hill, and she falls off the mountain, and she literally comes off, and she's, she also grabs onto a tree branch. It's a miracle that none of our team members died, right? It's a miracle that our missions organization did not get sued, right? And I remember she was, she, when she like came off the mountainside, and, her, and she was just like freely in the air, and then she saw the tree branch and grabbed it, and she, she, her body slammed into the mountain, and she had a bruise the size of her whole leg. And she climbed back up, and we were like, oh, my God, oh, my God, Mia, are you okay, right? Uh, uh, and then the next day, I remember I just sat down with Mia, and I was like, Mia, when you were in the air, in the side of the mountain, falling off, how did you feel? And I thought she was going to say, like, I was so scared, I was terrified, blah, blah, blah. And she just looks me dead in the eye. And this is how I know she's a gangster, right? She looks at me, and she goes... I had so much peace. And I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, I thought I would be scared falling off. But when I was in the air, I was like, oh, I get to go home. I get to go to heaven. And I was like, Mia, you're literally insane, right? I was like, you are so crazy. But that is a sister who knows the end of the story and has gotten rid of the fear of death. Let me tell you all something right now. Revelation chapter 21 tells us the end of the story. And this is the promise that you and I, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, that this life is not the end. Just because this mortal body, physical body dies, does not mean that our spirit will die a second death. In fact, we will actually go home. We will go into our spiritual bodies and we will live into the next life, our eternal life. And it is way better than any of this life. And this is where Jesus says, I make all things new. No longer will you have this old mortal physical body, but you will have a new glorious and spiritual body. Now this is what I'm trying to say to you all. 
You are so worried. You are so stressed out. You are so fixated on the things of this life that is temporary, that is old, when you could be focusing on the things of the new life. Let's be real here. Most of y'all, your only concern in this life right now in this season, in the, in the years that you guys are living, are what? To get a 4.0 GPA? If you take AP classes, 5.0 GPA? You're, what's, the, what's the major thing you're looking for is a 1600 SAT score? And maybe, maybe in, the, in your personal life, you're trying to look cute for that one boy. Or you're trying to, you know, look jacked for that one girl. And, and, and then what? All of that amounts to a boyfriend or a girlfriend who's going to leave you anyway? I'm just kidding. But that's just my youth pastor way of saying don't date. And you're going to graduate and you're hoping to get into a good college. What after that? You get into that good college. You graduate. You get into a good job. Good for you. What's after that? You get a good six-figure salary. You marry. You have 2.5 kids, which is the American dream statistically. You get a big house with a white picket fence. And then what? You die. And none of that goes with you. What's the point of living for anything in this life? And, and let me tell you all something. This life is so temporary compared to all of eternity. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, man lives maybe 80 years. If he's lucky, 100. And according to modern medicine and science, maybe 120 years. But let me tell you all something right now. That is just a, a moment, a fraction, a second of time compared to the fabric of eternity. Uh, I want to give you like an example real quick. Don't uh, uh, you come here. Grab that white, that white line with me real quick. Grab that white line. And, br and bring it here, okay? It just, it just has to be really long. Let's just see. It, it doesn't matter. Just bring the whole thing. Just bring the whole thing, okay? All right, y'all. Look, look over here. I did not, I did not, uh, I'm not a good preacher. I didn't uh, prepare this prop ahead of time. Just, just come in frame. Come in frame, Tongi. All right. This is a really long, long line, okay? Just go to the other side. Just make it look really long, okay? Hold it up. Hold it up, Tongi. Hold it up. There you go. This is a long line, y'all, okay? And let me tell y'all something right now. Let's, let's just imagine, pretend this is eternity, okay? And this is, the, this is Genesis 1, all right? This is eternity. And where Tongyu is standing, Tongyu, you're not in the frame. You got to come more, all right? It's a little more, a little more. Okay, stop right there, okay? And, okay, you're too close now, okay? Get back, all right? Now, imagine this is the all of eternity. And where Tongyu is standing is the end of time, okay? If this is all of eternity, your life, your 80-year, 100-year, 120-year life, it's, it's this small, okay? see how small is this small it's tiny you are focusing on a life okay you can get it out of here now you are focusing on a tiny fraction of life you're you could choose to invest all your energy all your time all of your strength into getting that gpa into getting that raise, into getting into that school, getting into that company, getting that girl as your girlfriend, getting that guy as your boyfriend, whatever. And you know what? When you die, none of that goes with you. None of that follows you. All of that is done. It stays in the old earth. Or you can live according to the new life. I don't know about you guys. I don't want to be rich in this life. I want to be rich in the next life. I'm just kidding. I do want to be rich in this life, but I'd rather be rich in the next life uh, if I'm being honest. Okay, I don't, I don't want to lie while I preach. Of course we all desire riches. That's the temptation of the flesh. But let me be honest with you guys. If I had to choose, I would choose riches in the next life. Why? Because the riches that are in the next life are for eternity, but the riches that are for this life last so little, 80, 100, 120 years, and it's done. See, some of you guys putting, a lot of people in America right now are putting their hope in a stimulus bill. Oh, give me that $600. Give me that $2,000, right? They're putting their hope in the government. But let me tell you all something right now. The government could fail. The stimulus bill could fail. Mitch McConnell could shut down the stimulus bill. But let me tell you all something right now. There's someone who will never fail, and his name is Jesus. Why? Because we know the end of the story. It's been prophetically revealed unto us that he will come back, and he will make all things new. Can I get an amen? Come on. All right. It's anticlimactic when everyone's on mute. But let me tell you the second thing that I want to talk to you about. You now have a new spirit. So we know that the first thing that he changes in Revelations 21 is a new earth. Actually, before I move on to that, let me say this. Did you guys know that heaven isn't some far off place? Heaven isn't some other dimension. Did you know that 
in the book of John, it shows that we are not going to heaven when we die. But heaven comes down to earth. Did you know that it doesn't say that when you die, you're going to, you know, your spirit's going to float up and all of that stuff. It says that in Thessalonians, but you're not going to another place. It says that the new heaven and the new earth will meet the new Jerusalem will come here. And so we're called to be good stewards of the things on this earth. We're called to be respectful and caretakers of the things on this earth. All right, just a brief point that I wanted to make before we move on. The second thing we see is that there's a new spirit within us. And uh, I just want to share this, this testimony with you guys really quick. Um, as you know, I, I went to the, I grew up in the church. I've been coming to church my whole life. And I remember I was very bitter at God because I never really felt his presence. And other people that I thought didn't deserve to feel God's presence felt it immediately. And the only reason I went to church in the beginning was because my mom made me, right? She would, she would rip the blankets off my bed, and she would, she would pull me by the ear and be like, you know what, shake your belly, you don't know, like, cute little God, right? And she's like, hey, you little rascal, right? For those of you guys who don't know Korean, right? You little rascal, like, go to church, right? And I remember I would, I would go begrudgingly, right? And we went through all the programs, you know, like, jump to the left and jump to the right and sing to the Lord with all of your mind. Raise your hands and wave them in the air and spread the good news everywhere, right? We did all of the VBS stuff. We did all of the Awana stuff. And then nothing ever worked. And I remember when we got into middle school and high school and all of that stuff, the preaching started to get really intense. We would go on these things called retreat, and people would start crying. And I, I started to get curious. I was like, what the heck is going on here? What's going on? And, and I remember I would see, like, gangsters, right? And this, my church was in L.A. in the 90s. At that time, there, were, there was a lot of gang activity. And I would see, like, these gangsters come in, right? Like, yo, what up, bro? My name is Johnny or, like, whatever. And they would try to act all hard. And then the sermon happens, and then the pastor's like, if you want to accept Jesus, come up to the front. All right, and then all the gangbangers are like, yo, this is crazy. Right? All right, and then they come up to the front, and then they're like, if you want to accept Jesus, raise your hands in the air. And they raise their hands in the air. And then, you know, these gangsters, they shed a single gangster tear, you know. Yo, Jesus, I'll give you my life, right. And I remember I just look at them, and I'm like, yo, God, this is messed up. I've been coming to church all my life, and I never felt this blessing. This fool been gangbanging, maybe killing people, and, like, just he comes here one time, and he gets blessed. This is jacked up, right? Or I see, like, some of the homies, like some of the party girls, like the E-ravers and all of that stuff, they come, and, and, and they come up to the altar, and then their mascara comes down with their with their tears and their face looks like Medusa and it's just jacked up and they're like oh I love Jesus and and back then the Jesus is my boyfriend theology was really big and I was like that's jacked up this girl goes out partying every weekend and so easily she gets to feel the presence of God and I was like I've been to every retreat VBS Awana camp whatever and I never got to feel the presence of God and I was like, God, what the heck? What's going on here? And then I remember um, in seventh grade, my dad actually passed away. And um, my mom had to move over to Korea. My sister was gone off to school. And I actually lived by myself from eighth grade to 11th grade. Right? I lived by myself. And... Um, it was, just, it was a hard struggle. It was a difficult time. And I remember at that, in those times, I lost about 25 pounds because we didn't have enough to afford a meal. So I would eat maybe like once every two days. And I remember the electricity would go out because we couldn't pay the bills. And I'd come home, and it'd be dark. I remember I'd have to take showers before going to school, and it would be cold showers because we didn't have enough money to pay for the heating and stuff like that. And it was a struggle. And at that time, I walked away from the Lord because I had stopped believing in God when my dad passed away. And I remember so clearly one of my homies, he comes up to me. He's like, hey, you want to come to church? And I was like, nah, I don't believe in that anymore. I stopped going to church. And then he was like, we have free food. And I was like, all right, bet. I'm there. So I go to church with him on Sunday. And, uh, you know, I was, I was 14, 15 years old. And we get there, and there's a new pastor He's young. He's like 18 years old. Um, and he starts preaching. And I remember he preaches some of the, the, one of the 
craziest sermons I've ever heard. And you know it's memorable because I still remember it 12 years later, right? Some of y'all don't even remember the sermon I gave yesterday, right? If I were to ask you what's the second point, you'll be like, ah, uh, prescription? I don't know. And let me tell y'all something. He started to go crazy. And for me who grew up in the church, I never trusted pastors because they just seemed like car salesmen who were trying to grease me. Right? They just wanted my offering money. They just wanted me to stay late for service so I could help clean up the chairs, right? Like, oh, you, you're trying to bait me into chair cleaning ministry? Not today, right? And I remember it was just, I hated church. I hated pastor. Everybody seemed so fake, all of that stuff. But I remember this is the first time I heard a pastor preaching as if he really believed in what he was speaking. He talked about Jesus as if he really knew him. He talked about spiritual things as if he ex actually experienced it. And I remember I was like, who is this guy? What has he gone through? How does he know this Jesus? How does he know this Holy Spirit? And I remember at that time, he was like, he was going off. He was like, Jesus! Right? Like he was going crazy. And he invited us up to the altar call. And I was just sitting in my chair. And I was like, yeah, right. I'm not going up. I've, I've been in retreats before. This ain't real. But all my friends, all my other homies, they all stood up and they start walking. And I'm like, traitors. Right? <laughs> And then so I'm like, all right, I don't want to be the only dude st sitting in the chair because there was only 10 of us in the service. It was a small church. And I go up to the front with them. And he's like, if you want to feel the love of God for real, begin to pray. And something in my heart was like, God, I don't love you. I don't like you. I don't want you. But I'm curious. I want to want you. I want to desire you. I want to actually maybe try to find out to know you. And so we started praying. And I was praying and praying and praying. And we did, you know, yell Jesus three times. One, two, three. Jesus! Ah! Right? I, tried, I tried my best. And I remember in the middle of the service, nothing. I wasn't feeling anything. And do you ever do that thing at a retreat where you're, everyone's praying, but you're not getting anything and you're trying to do a status like a status check, so you kind of open your eyes slightly and you look around and you see how everyone else is doing. I did that. I kind of opened my eyes, but only a little bit because if you open it too much, the pastor can see that you have your eyes open. So I open around. Every single person in the room is lying down on the ground, slain by the Holy Spirit. Tears are falling down their face and they're all praying in tongues like, ding dong, right? And I was just like, what the frick, right? What's going on? What the heck? And uh, I remember I, I was just trying to fake it and, like, blend in. I just got on my knees slowly, and I was like, what the heck? But then I just started to cry. And it wasn't even crying tears of blessing, tears of love. It was just tears of anger, tears of bitterness, tears of rejection. Because I was like, dang, God, am I, am I like, predestined for hell? You know, like when you grow up in the church, but you don't really read the Bible, so you have like broken theology, where you know words like predestination, but you don't really know the application. So I'm like, am I predestined for hell? And I was just like, God, do you not love me? Am I never going to be accepted? Blah, blah, blah. And I was just so angry. And then service ends. And you know, there's always that one kid in youth group who um, purposely leaves the group and just pretends to be doing their own thing in the corner, all sad and depressed and emo. And uh, we call that flaming, right? where that one guy is just trying to get attention. And then the youth pastor comes up to me and is like, hey, Jimmy, what's wrong? Are you okay? And I'm like, no. <laughs> Super melodramatic. Like teenagers think that their life is like the hardest. And it's like, no, I'm not okay. Right? And then he was like, he was like, what's wrong? And, uh, you know, I, I, oh, I cringe now that I remember it. But at that time, I thought it was super deep. I was like, I've been through this before. I've gone to retreats. I've done the emotional high and then falling back. This isn't real, right? And then he was like, if I was him, I would have been like, shut up, right? But he was generous and gracious, and he was like, hey, come to Mexico missions with us. And I was like, no. And he was like, come on, just come. And I was like, fine. <laughs> and then we go, the next week, we go to Mexico missions. And... This is the first time I see 300 people my age going all out praying to God. See, I grew up in the church, but I only saw 5 a.m. prayer meetings, harmonies, grandmas praying, right, all out. I never saw people my age. And all of a sudden, I see people just 
pounding their chest, crying out, Jesus, crying, all that stuff. So I tried to do that. I was like, oh, that's how you feel the presence of God. You got to do that. So I, I went up there, and I was just like yelling and beating and all of that stuff. Nothing happened. Next day, I saw one of the nunas in the back. She, you know, she was on her knees, her skirt all prettily laid out. She had her moleskin journal in front of her. She was just journaling, and she, a, a single tear fell. And I was like, oh, I'm not one of the intense types. I'm the, I'm the sensitive type, right? So I, I went next to her. I sat down, too. And I just started to think, you know, about all the saddest things in my life. And I started to think about, like, all the sad Korean dramas I could think. You know, I was like, oh, she lost her eyes. She became blind. Oh, he gave his eyes to her. Oh, she went blind again. What a waste, right? And I was trying to think of all these sad thoughts, and nothing would happen, and I wouldn't cry. And then I hear these testimonies of these people being like, I prayed, and I saw the Lord spell out with the stars, M-I-S-S-I-O-N-A-R-Y, missionary. I'm called to be a missionary. And I was like... I see R I C H. I'm called to be rich, right? I was like, God, give me something. I want a vision. I want some kind of prophetic word, whatever. Nothing was coming. And I and I tried all of the things. I would ask for the pastors to, to pray for me, to put their hand on my head. And I was like, I don't even care if you push me. I, I'll, I'll take it, right? Like, I'll take anything, God. At this point, I'm desperate. I need to know that you're real. I need to know that you love me. I need to feel something. After a whole week... And we have three services a day, y'all. That's 21 services. And each service is like four hours. That's like 84 hours in one week of praying and desperately crying out and nothing happening at all. I was so depressed and discouraged. I was like, God, who's supposed to love everybody, it's like his job, doesn't love me. And I remember I just got down on my knees and I quit. And I, and I prayed the prayer that we probably all prayed before. I said, God. If you don't do something, I'm going to go back to America, and I'm just going to sin as much as I want. I'm going to do whatever I want, and right before I die, I'll accept you, right, just because I'm scared of hell. And I was like, but God, if you're real, and this is when I began to pray one of the most honest prayers I've ever prayed. I said, God, if you are real, I just want to know you love me. I don't care if I don't feel anything. I don't care if I don't cry. I don't care if I don't fall backwards. I don't care if I don't get a vision or a healing or a miracle or some kind of a revelation. And I just began to pray the most honest prayer of my life. And in that moment when I surrendered everything, when I gave up everything, and I was humbled to the point of pure honesty, the Lord began to speak to me. And I heard the voice of God for the first time in my life. And he said, Jimmy, you are my son and I am your father. And I know I heard, I'm not saying that I heard the audible voice of God. It's not like the heavens opened up and a booming voice came from the clouds like, Jimmy, right? I'm not saying that. It, it was more like my own thoughts speaking to me, but I knew that they weren't my thoughts. Some of y'all don't believe in that. You're like, nope, you're just making it up. But let me tell y'all something right now. Spiritual beings can come into you and speak to you, and it may sound like your own thoughts, but it's not really your own voice. Because you know how I know? Some of y'all have thoughts that you can't even control. We begin to make a mistake, and you say, why am I so stupid? Why am I so stupid? Why am I so stupid? You begin to beat yourself up. But that's the enemy lying to you, disguising his and camouflaging his own deception, his own lie and discouragement as your own thought, as your own voice. And some of y'all want to stop being depressed. Some of y'all want to stop being insecure. Some of y'all want to stop being so self-conscious. You constantly say, I'm so ugly. I can't sing. I'm not smart enough. I'm not loved. But let me tell y'all something right now. You think that those are your own thoughts? Those are the lies of the enemy disguised as your own thoughts. But let me tell y'all something right now. If the devil can do that, the Lord can do that as well. And this was the moment in my life where I knew God was speaking to me. And I didn't need to be some kind of an audible voice from the heavens. I didn't need to be some kind of a miraculous voice. I just knew that it was him at that moment. And I even heard that line all my life growing up in the church. You know, God is our dad, we're his children, blah, blah, blah. But let me tell you something right now. Every single cliche, when it comes directly from the mouth of God, actually becomes meaningful, actually becomes impactful. And I heard that, and memory started to flood through my life about all the times that I didn't have a father. See, I told you all before, my dad died at seventh grade, but he never lived with us. And I remember I would always get so jealous when I would go to the park, and I would see kids throwing a ball or whatever with their dad. And I was like, I don't care. I don't need someone to play catch with me. But deep down inside, I was like, I wish I had someone to play catch with me. 
I remember so clearly, middle school, we started to grow facial hair, right? And I, and I, I had some facial hair, and I looked like a pervert, so I needed to shave it. And I remember I got a razor, and I cut myself everywhere trying to shave my first time. I came back to school the next day. All my homies roasted me. They were like, ah, you cut yourself, blah, blah, blah. You look like a noob, whatever. And I remember I was like, ha, 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 right? And then, but deep on the inside, you guys know what I'm talking about. When you get roasted by your friends, you have to, like, pretend to laugh on the outside, and you're okay. But deep down inside, you're like, I don't got nobody to teach me how to shave, yo, right? Like, this sucks. And I remember orchestra. Everybody would come with their, their nice clothes, and you have to wear a tie to play, you know, vi third violin. And I remember everybody had a tie, but I had a clip-on, and my clip-on fell off. And all my homies started roasting me. They were like, bro, you got a clip-on tie? You're so dumb, right? And I was like, ah, dude, you don't even know. This is the new trend. Like, clip-on is cooler, bro. But, like, deep down inside, I was like, there was no one to teach me how to tie a tie. And I remember all those memories of feeling so abandoned, all those memories of my life where I felt like I had nobody with me, where I had no father. And right when he spoke those words, you know what's crazy? It, it's kind of like he was rewriting my story. Those, those memories came back like a, like a home movie in the picture of my mind. And I started to see myself as a child, as a youth, getting, getting um, you know, destroyed in the, in the roasting sessions. And I thought I was alone, but I started to see God was with me in those moments. I started to see that God was actually there when I thought I was alone. And he was giving me a new story. And he was giving me a new spirit. He was giving me a new father, a new family, new everything. And the reason why I share this story with you guys is I want to let you guys know. A lot of the times you come to church and Pastor Nathan, Pastor Kevin is preaching, Pastor Tony is doing his thing, praise team is doing their thing, and that one girl in youth group is crying, and that one gangster newcomer is shedding a single gangster tear, and you're just like, how come I can't feel anything? How come nothing's happening to me? Let me tell you something right now. If you start to think that way, you're not seeking God. You're not praying to God. You're not asking for God. You're asking for feelings. And let me tell you something. That's become an idol itself. Feelings, blessings, uh, miracles, all of these things, these have become idols. You know what's crazy? I go to some small, I, I, I sit in some small groups, and all they talk about is, how are you doing? The next week, how are you doing spiritually? The next week, how are you doing spiritually? Stop asking me how I'm doing. It's only been a week, right? And you know what? Our spiritual health, it's kind of sick in the American church. Our spiritual health has become our idol. Like, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? Well, how about we go out and we do some kingdom work instead, y'all? Like, uh, I'll feel better spiritually if we just went out instead of you just talking to me how I'm doing all the time, right? And I, I want to I tell y'all something right now. We come before the Lord with a greedy, selfish, me, 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 me desire. But when you come to the Lord with a new perspective and you just say, God, I just want to know you and I want to be known by you. What you need to receive at that moment will come to you. It will come. You get a new story. And the final thing that I want to I close out with is, you have a new calling. And uh, praise him, you guys could come up, but I'll just end with this last point because we're running out of time. It's, it's getting to the closing. But I want to I wanna go back to this passage in Revelation chapter 21 when he says, I'm making everything new. But there's a part that I want to focus in on. All right. I want you guys to jump with me to verse... Let's start at verse 3. I think verse 3 is a good place to start. Revelations chapter 21, verse 3. Revelations chapter 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. 
he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Now, I want to I wanna tell you guys something. I, I thought it was so interesting. I thought it was so interesting that God says, I'm going to wipe away every tear in this passage. Because they are in heaven now. Why are these people crying? But if you look at the context of this passage, just one chapter before, Revelations chapter 20, we find out why they're crying. We see that there is a lake of fire. And on judgment day, there will be two lines. One line of people are going into heaven to join the Lord. And the other line of people are sinners who have never accepted Jesus and they are being thrown into the lake of fire and one thing that I realized one thing that I learned as I studied this passage and as, as I was being taught scriptures one thing that we learned was the reason why people in heaven were crying and God needed to wipe away every tear one last time was because they saw someone in the other line going into the lake of fire that they knew that they could have helped, that they could have told about Jesus. I'm sorry to say, but some of you guys on Judgment Day, when you're standing, some of you are saved, some of you may not be saved. I pray that you receive the Lord Jesus Christ today. And some of you who are saved, you're going to be standing in that line, going to heaven, and you're going to look to the other, other line. And you're going to see a friend from school. And that friend from school is going to look at you and say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you let me know? And your only excuse is going to be like, I thought it would be awkward to talk about God. Let me tell you all something right now. The pain of seeing a loved one, the pain of seeing a friend in the line that goes to the lake of fire is going to far outweigh any awkwardness that you experience in this life. Let me tell y'all something right now. When you get into that line to go to heaven and you see someone in the other side, in that other line, you're gonna say, I wish I talked to them. Now, the, some of y'all might be saying like, man, Pastor Jimmy, why, why are you saying it like this? Why are, you, why are you being so intense? Isn't the church supposed to be about love and, and acceptance? Isn't, isn't God about love and acceptance? Let me tell y'all something right now. If you truly love someone and bad news was coming, wouldn't you warn them? <laughs> Preaching about hell, some people are like, oh man, the church is so exclusive. The church is so hate-filled. The church is so mean. It's not gracious and loving like it says it is because they believe in a concept of hell. Let me tell you all something right now. Hell is a reality. And I used to get so angry at preachers who talked about hell because they're just trying to scare people and emotionally manipulate people. But let me tell you all something. An enemy threatens, but a friend warns. I don't come to you to talk to you about hell as an enemy threatening you to believe. No, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to warn you because I've seen the reality of it. I hate the idea of hell more than any other Christian I know. I wish I could get the Bible and erase every page, every instance that hell is mentioned. I wish we could get rid of the idea of hell. I hate that idea. Now, the reason why I hate that idea is because I know, what it, I know what it feels like because I believe that when I am in that line, I will see many people in that line, but particularly one person. I remember in seventh grade, my mom, she sat us down one morning. And she looks at me and she says, we have to sell everything we have. We have to sell the house, the car, every furniture, everything. You gotta say goodbye. You're leaving your school. We're moving to Korea. And I said, why? She said, Abba is sick right now. Your dad is sick. And I said, okay, what's going to happen? And she was like, he's suffering from a disease, and he's on his deathbed. Harmony just called and told us to all come. So we pack up everything. And the day of our flight comes, and we're about to, we're about to go. And I remember I start praying. And it's kind of weird that I started praying because... 
I didn't really have a relationship with Jesus. I told you guys I grew up in the church, but I never really had a relationship with God. I never really prayed. And I remember in that moment, I started to pray because I knew what happens to people who die when they don't believe in God. And I knew that my dad did not believe in God. He was one of those ajashis that would come to church because his wife forced him to come. He would just sit through the service forward and then he would leave immediately. And I remember as I was on that plane flying over to Korea, I remember I, I prayed and I was a little kid, I got down on my knees in the airplane and I was like, God, please keep my dad alive just long enough so that I can tell him about the gospel. I can tell him about Jesus. And I felt like a fire. I was like, yeah, oh man, this is good, this is good. Okay, when I land, I'm gonna, we're gonna go straight to the hospital and I'm gonna tell my dad about Jesus. And he's gonna believe right before he dies and it, he's gonna go to heaven. And then I remember we land and uh, we go to the public the phone and we call my grandma and, and my grandma is wailing. She's, she's crying, shouting, she's like, <sighs> salvation, 
come before the Lord and say, God, would you fill me with your, with your blessing? Would you fill me with your salvation? I accept you as my Lord and Savior. If there is any doubt, come before the Lord and ask for him to take your life. Because when you are saved, you know. See, when you are saved and the Holy Spirit fills you, you know. You are filled with this kind of love that changes you and your life is never the same. You're never the same as you were before. You would know if you were saved. Without a doubt in mind. Because it says in the book of Ephesians that the helmet of salvation shall come upon you. I'm not saying you become perfect. I'm not saying you never fall. I'm not saying you never wrestle with sin again. But I'm saying that inside of you, you know there's a knowledge of the salvation of the Lord. I don't want to see any of you falling into the lake of fire. But let me tell you all something right now. Salvation, it's not a matter of receiving. I used to think salvation was about receiving a blessing, receiving a gift from the Lord. No, it's not about receiving. It's a giving. It's a giving of yourself unto the Lord. Because when you give all of yourself, you receive more than you ever return. In the Old Testament, the Leviticus people, the, Le the Levites knew that the fire of God falls where the sacrifice is. You wonder where the Spirit of the Lord is going to come. It comes wherever there's a sacrifice. And Jesus paid the ultimate price, the ultimate sacrifice. And the job is finished. Now all you and I need to do, we don't need to die for the Lord. We just need to come before the Lord and say, God, I lay down my life and I give you my heart. I give you my trust. I give you my future. Right now, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to close your eyes with me right now. And I want you to just put your hand over your heart. accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior before, and you want to, I want you to just begin to give your life and your heart to Jesus and say, God, I want to know what it means to have full trust without a doubt in mind. I want to know what it means to be cleansed from sin. I want you to begin to repent of your sinful ways. If you've accepted Jesus before, but you just did it because everyone else was doing it and you're not really sure and you weren't really filled with faith in that moment. I want you to come before the Lord and say, God, I want, I want, to, I want to know that I know, that I know, that I know that you are in me, that I am yours. If you doubt your salvation, I want you to come before the Lord and say, Lord, would you just fill me up, oh God? I give you my life and I give you my heart. Take a moment to pray that right now. Take a moment to repent of your sins. Take a moment to ask that the Holy Spirit would fill you up. Let's pray right now. Don't be afraid of the people to your left or to your right. Don't be afraid of your family members right outside of your roof. Just begin to lift up your voice and begin to pray to Jesus. There you go. Don't stop. Some of you are feeling the presence of God so strongly in your room. Some of you guys are feeling the Holy Spirit in your room right now. Jesus, let it flow. Don't stop, don't stop. Let your spirit flow. Let your prayers go. Jesus. Jesus.
Right now, if you're talking to the Holy Spirit, continue to speak to Him and He's speaking to you. But right now, I want us to begin to pray for those we know in our lives that are not saved. It is not the job of your pastor to save everyone. It is not the job of your small group leader to make everyone believe in Jesus. Let me tell you something right now. Do you have a friend at church who just comes out religiously because their family does and doesn't really know Jesus? Do you have a friend at school? Do you have a mother, father, brother, sister, somebody in your life that you know doesn't believe in Jesus? As you imagine them on judgment day and they're going into the lake of fire, does that not break your heart? Does that not drive you to a place of prayer, a place of intercession that says, Holy Spirit, would you begin to speak to them? Would you allow conversations to happen between me and them where we can talk about Jesus, where we can talk about God? Lord, would you allow moments of invitation to church to happen? Right now, if you can think of that person, I want you to say their name. On the count of three, say their name. One, two, three. Right now, we're going to begin to pray for them and say, and call out to God and say, God, would you bring the knowledge of Jesus to them? Would you save them? Let's begin to pray right now, church. Lift up your brother. Lift up your sister. Lift up your mother, your father. Do not let the devil have his way. Do not let awkwardness, apathy, complacency. Do not let the things of this world stop you. Let's cry out to the Lord. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, oh Lord God, I ask that every single student on this call may know you, God. Show me the love of my beloved, 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 my be
shocked at this. I said, where are the, where are the people who want to intercede? Where are the people who want to advance the gospel? Where are the people who want to bring the knowledge of the holy into this world? Let me tell you something right now. If you're feeling a brokenness for the lost, there's, a, there's an anointing from the heaven falling upon you right now. Not everybody on this call is feeling something. Not everybody on this call is being moved by the Spirit. And that's okay if you're not. I'm not trying to condemn you or say that you are any less than. But what I am trying to say is, those of you who are feeling a brokenness for the lost, those of you who are feeling a, a compulsion, like, is there something that I can do? Is there somewhere I can go? Is there something I can say? And I want to tell you right now, the Holy Spirit is calling you right now. And let me be honest with you, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can say. The best sermons I've heard will not change a hard heart. Going to the mission field, serving more at church, that doesn't bring revival. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But what you and I can do is we can be surrendered vessels and we can get upon our knees and we can begin to pray and we can be available at any moment that when the opportune time comes that we will be able to speak about Christ to the people who need to receive it. Right now, if you are someone who wants to advance the kingdom, if you want to be used by God, if you want to reach the lost, I believe a special anointing is falling upon you right now. I want you to pour, put your hands before you like this. I want you to put your hands before you as if you're receiving a gift from heaven. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit would fall upon you wherever you are in your room. But let me tell you something right now. Those of you who ask for the Holy Spirit's anointing, you must know that it comes at a cost. See, salvation is free, but the anointing to activate the power, it comes to a surrendered life. It comes to a broken vessel. It comes to a person who said, God, I used to live according to my ways, my thoughts, but now I surrender myself and I live according to your ways and your thoughts only.
the greatest area of surrender. I'm receiving this for somebody at this call right now. The greatest area of surrender for some of you is family. You are, you are such a good Christian at, at church. You may even be a good person at school. But one area some of you really struggle with is in your family, with your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. And I was the exact same way. I had so much fighting with my mom growing up because I never felt like she loved me. You know, when I was a kid, all I wanted was for her to play with me. She never played with me. She was always working. When I got older, all I ever wanted was to hear, I love you. But my mom, she's, a, she's from Busan, so she's a, a strong, cold-hearted woman, you know? And she never said that. And I, I would watch American movies growing up. And the American moms always, I love you, right? Never heard that from my mom. I never heard that I'm proud of you. And so when she went to Korea and she left me here, I just felt so much bitterness towards her. And I remember when she came back in 11th grade, she and I would just fight and fight and fight and fight. And I remember one day it was really bad. I came home late at night hanging out with my friends. And she just said, where have you been? And I said, we just started shouting at each other. We had these shouting matches. And I remember I said, you don't deserve to be my mom because you left. I, I saw a look of hurt. And my mom always fights back, but this time she, she's like, I have so, okay. And she just leaves. That's how my senior year ended, and I went off to college in New York. And I remember the Holy Spirit was ministering to me and providing me so much healing. But one day I listened to a song. It was by a Korean-American band. And uh, I was just praying, and the song, it says, Oma, you never said 사랑해. But you always ask me, Pirupa. And for those of you guys who don't know Korean, it says, Mom, you never asked me, or you never said, I love you, but you always ask me, Are you hungry? And for some reason, I just started to weep and weep and weep, and a newfound love for my mom, a newfound appreciation for my mom began to emerge. And the Holy Spirit just began to speak to me. He's like, Your mom couldn't play with you when you were little because she was busy working as a single mom because your dad was gone. It's not because your mom didn't love you. It's because she loved you so much that she was providing for you. Your mom didn't know how to say I love you because her mom never told her she loves her. But she loves you, but she only knew how to say it in dysfunctional ways. And I remember when I came home for winter break from college, I just sat down with my mom, and I had so much love for her now. And I remember I asked her, Oma, what's the happiest memory you had in your life? And she said, when I was a little kid, we were really poor. We had to go into the fields and look for crickets to eat as chips. I was like, dang, you were really poor, po, right? And she said, one time we went to Kanda, which is a rich neighborhood, and a businessman gave me an egg. In those times in Korea, bananas and eggs were rare. Rich people ate that. She ate that egg, and she said she was so happy, and it was her favorite food. And then all of a sudden, flashbacks of my entire life started to come. My mom would make an egg for me every day, every day, without fail. And I would, I would always be running out to school because I was late. And she was like, make sure you eat your egg, right? And she was like, she expressed her love in violent, aggressive ways, you know? Why am I sharing this story? When we are already way over time, and some of y'all are zoomed out and you want to close this call. The reason why I'm sharing this story is someone on this call needs to know that your family loves you in ways that you might not understand. My mom loved me in ways that I couldn't understand. And when I heard that about the egg, I just started to weep and weep away from her, obviously, because I don't like showing her my emotions. But ever since then, my relationship with her has gotten so much better. We used to walk in the mall and I would hold her hand in the beginning because I'm trying to show her I love her now. And she would slap my hand away, but she could all, right? That was disgusting. But I keep doing, I keep doing it now. She likes it when I hold her hand. I see her kind of smile. Right? She used to watch Korean dramas by herself, and I would sit down with her, and I would, I would put my head, my head on her shoulder. I'm like, Oma, what are you watching? 
And she went, oh, chingulo, right? And now I do it, she likes it. My relationship with my mom has become a 180 degree turn. So much better. And I'm trying to tell you this. The Lord is going to restore your family relationships. He's going to give you new family. But let me tell you something right now. It's only going to happen if you're willing to surrender. The greatest area of surrender is in your family. Because they're going to piss you off. They're going to things that challenge your pride. They're going to do things that make you still feel like a baby when you want to say, I'm a grown man now. I'm a grown woman now. But they still treat you like a little kid. Let your pride down. And say, God, I surrender and I just I choose to love. And right now, this is the last prayer before we close. I want someone in this room who's having a hard time with their family. I want you to begin to forgive your mom for all of the times she called you fat, ugly, no future, dumb, not as good as that friend. Maybe never even said those things, but just doesn't shower as much affection on you as she does your sibling. I want you to right now just begin to forgive your mom, forgive your dad. I want you to just come before the Lord and say, Lord, I forgive my parents for all of their hurt and the pain that they caused me. Now, let me tell you all something right now. Forgiveness is different from trust. If your parents violated your trust legitimately, I'm not saying you have to trust them yet. That will build as your relationship goes forward. But I am saying today, you, you forgive. Say, God, I will refuse to let this pain stay. I give this to you and I release them. I want you to begin to forgive your mother and your father.
before we close, let's just take this time to say thank you, Jesus. Let's bring it back to the person of Jesus. In your mind's eye, I want you to just see Jesus. Now, before we move on to this, actually, I want to talk about the last thing we prayed about. If some of you are having a hard time forgiving your mother or father, I understand that there are sometimes people with years of pain and that it requires a process, it requires time, seasons to go through them. And I commend you for starting that journey, starting that process. Now let's just come before the Lord and begin to say, thank you, Jesus. Repeat that with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Thank you, Jesus.
right now. If you uh, just are blessed in the chat, could you just say hallelujah or amen and hashtag let's get it GMI 2021. That's a long hashtag. You could just do part of that. Uh, with that being said, Pastor Kevin, are you going to come up here? Okay. He needs to sanitize this mic because I spit all over it. Peace out, y'all. I love you guys. I hope I can see you in person one day. Pastor Jimmy. Uh, well, uh, just to give you guys enough time, uh, I want to transition you guys into your small group. Um, your leaders have some specific instructions for you guys when you guys enter your small group. So please make sure leaders check your chat, uh, check, check our leaders chat uh, before you guys uh, continue on. Uh, there's a couple of things that we would like you guys for do, uh, to do. So please, uh, yeah, you guys, right now, if we're ready to go into the small group, uh, we're going to transition into a ton of small group so we can maximize the amount of time you guys have together. Uh, be blessed. And uh, once you guys are done as a small group, uh, I want to encourage you guys, please close together in prayer. Bless one another. And, uh, oh, and then leaders, please make sure you take a screenshot of your group. Okay, please take a screenshot of your group. And then send it over to your pastors or uh, for high school, send everything to Pastor Tony. And uh, junior high, send it to whoever you need to send it to. All right. So uh, thank you guys. Man, I really, really pray and hope and we're excited uh, to hear testimonies uh, from this retreat. Uh, other than that, we'll see you guys. Be blessed. All right. Have a great time, a small group. And uh, enjoy this time. All right. Is small groups open? Oh, there you go. There you go. All right.